This is part three of our discussion and conversation about the book Miracle of Forgiveness. Next on Polygamy, what love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age, but she ran away. That girl was me. I was lost. Then Jesus Christ found me. I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in Him. Welcome back for our final discussion on the book that we have been talking about, The Miracle of Forgiveness, written by President uh, Spencer W. Kimball. And I'd like to thank Aaron for coming back and, and going through this and your thoughts. They're great thoughts. I love your Appreciate your it. excitement about God's grace and forgiveness. Appreciate it. And it was something that was so new and so, so exciting to me when I first heard it after having been born and raised in the polygamy group because they are works oriented just like the LDS Church are. And of course, polygamy is what makes it all work, that holds it all together. Um, we ended our last time in quoting Brigham Young, and we're going to uh, quote him again, where he said, Take up the Bible, compare the religion of the Latter-day Saints with it, and see if it will stand the test. And so that's what we're doing. Now, he said that many, many years ago, and that's what we're doing. And you do that a lot. I've done that a lot. And we know people who have, and we're often criticized pretty heavily for it, for, for actually challenging their doctrine. Uh, so we're going to continue to do that as we go through Spencer Kimball's book on the painful experience that he has in a long, drawn-out process that he has outlined for us on reaching uh, forgiveness through this long repentance process. On page 209, Kimball writes that being perfect means to triumph over sin. Mm -hmm. He said, God would never ask us to do something that we cannot do, so therefore perfection is an achievable goal. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that statement? Um, it's in 1 John 1, chapter 1, for example, we're taught that if anyone who says he does not have sin, he's a liar, and the <laughs> truth does not abide in him. And uh, in this letter by John, 1 John, he says, if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And he talks about walking in the light. Mm -hmm. what, if, you, if you read this book, you ask yourself, what does it mean to walk in the light? Uh, what does it mean to be in this condition where you can have your sins forgiven and, and for yourself to be cleansed? And know they're forgiven every day. Absolutely. And he even says in the book, I'm writing this so that you may know, know. that you have eternal life. Well, according to 1 John, to be in the light is to be the kind of person who doesn't claim to be sinless, mm -hmm. who's not um, avoiding the confession of sins, somebody but who's freely uh, confessing their sins and somebody who's uh, going to the Lord Jesus Christ because of their lack of righteousness, because of their... Uh, so it, it's just, it's not real. Spencer Kimball has not given us a biblical or realistic standard for arriving at I don't think that he's given a very hopeful standard mm -mm. at all. Um, after reading that book, you'd walk away shaking your head, like wondering if you ever, if forgiveness was ever really possible. I, 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 a little anecdote here. I've, I've spoken to LDS missionaries who have told me, when I brought up the book, um, not realizing how controversial it is outside of Mormonism, they will tell me, well, my mission president specifically told me that I was not allowed to read that book on wow. my mission. Wow, wow. This is recent. This, this is, is like the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, so uh, obviously they have a policy in their missions typically not to read anything outside of the reference library, the missionary reference library, which is a short set of uh, uh, approved readings. Um, sometimes people will go outside of that and get permission to read whatever, but yeah. still today LDS missionaries are instructed in certain mission areas, do not read that book. And they've said not to read that one, huh? Mm -hmm. And it used to be a required reading. Uh, it used to be paraded. If you go uh, to the Eldest History Museum, behind the glass for Spencer Kimball, this book is showcased as one of his crowning achievements. And yet they can't read it. And yet they're, they're ashamed of it today. There's, there's a kind of a double-mindedness about this. They're embarrassed by the book. Well, they should be. Yeah. I, you know, I can't complain about that part of it because they should be. 
Um, this is something uh, w w that they should be ashamed of, because, and it's in the book on page 220, where he's, he writes, repentance seems a very difficult, long, agonizing process and is usually embarrassing. Um, <laughs> if, if, if like, well, if you need to like have prolonged 30 years of shame before you arrive at forgiveness, I don't agree. Uh, it, it, is it humbling to confess your sins? Yeah. Um, there's something there's something beautiful there's though, something about very freeing when you, about when it. you open yourself up this is very different from the world because right now uh, our culture thinks of authenticity as sort of a primary virtue so if I'm a bad person but I'm just authentic about it that's a good thing Christianity says no it's not that the authenticity makes everything okay it's that it's it's different it's it's you're a sinner, and if you open yourself up and you're honest about how um, bad you are with God and other people, um, it's not that the honesty earns you points with God or people. Right. It, it's that it, what it does is it connects you uh -huh. to grace. It, uh -huh. it's it like, connects Lord, us to grace. That's right. Confess your sins. And forgiveness. And he, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Right. So that long agonizing. I, well, I want to be clear, though. There, there's, there's a part of repentance that's sorrow. Godly sorrow brings yeah. repentance, it says. But I think Spencer Kimball underestimates the how quick this can happen. The miracle of a heart change when somebody says, Oh, Lord, and the realization, coming to the realization of, I'm a sinner. I just don't make sinful mistakes. I mean, I'm a sinner. Yeah. I'm bent towards yeah. sin. Lord, God, I'm so sorry. And then he shows up and Please he forgives. Please forgive me. He and he me. does. Oh, and he does it. It's not, well, you're, I need you to... Uh, Sort of sit on that shame for a while. Yeah. And you know no. what? That's exactly the way it was. It's one reason that I hated certain words coming out of the polygamy group. The, and repentance and obedience were two of those words I just detested because they had they had placed this, these horrible definitions on them and repentance was one of them, a long, drawn out, put your face in the gravel and rub, rub it around a while, you know. And, Do it good enough and, so that you'll someday be Right, forgiven. right. The penance right. and the embarrassment and all of that went with it. I hated it. You know, God doesn't, he, God wants me to be, in Romans 6, Paul talks about the things of which you are now ashamed. So yeah, there, there is a, yeah. I feel ashamed of having been a sinner. But what's, what's great about the gospel is that I am not meant to sit paralyzed, feeling sorry for myself, or um, emotionally sort of emptied of my joy. Uh, the, the, being ashamed of the things I've formerly done it's like singing Amazing Grace. We're not grace. walking in shame, though. I'm just, free. I'm yeah. forgiven. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. A wretch. When I say those be, words, yeah. I'm ashamed of what I did, but I got a smile on my face that yes. saved a wretch like me. I was once was lost. I was bad. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And this is this is the Romans four again. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Uh -huh, so there's uh -huh. there's this uh, yeah there's I was I'm ashamed of what I did, but. The gospel emotionally frees you up right now Absolutely to, to be you. liberated and go a forward. And, and to go a little bit further with that, once we've been forgiven, and we know we are forgiven, by the way, when we accept Jesus as our Savior and, and, and our forgiver, uh, there's no more shame and there's no more guilt because the sins are gone. They're, they're washed nailed. away. They're nailed to the cross. You don't have a debt hanging over your head. No debt. I have, I have a mortgage right now. I just bought a house. And uh, certain LDS leaders have talked about the atonement as uh, not the cancellation of debt, but a refinancing of debt. And it's a terrible analogy. Oh, it, it's it's that's, so terrible. It's, that's uh, uh, that's it's, uh, bad. <laughs> uh, but, but what's cool about Col the book of Colossians, Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians, and he says that Christ canceled the record of debt that stood against us with yeah. its demands. Mm -hmm. And nailed it to the and cross. And I, I, can, I yeah. can think about this clearly right now because I have this 30-year mortgage that I just yeah. started. And I've got to, I've got to, main, you know, I've got to make sure that I, you know, maintain mm -hmm. and develop a career. I'm a programmer, and I, I got to make sure I got, I, got, I have a payment to make every month. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's not as it's though Christ obligation. forgave yep. us, and He put that shame and the debt over you and said, "Well, I've refinanced it to make it easier to pay off." Right. But you still got to, it. I mean, it's like it's gone. It's like someone walked up and said, "How much is your mortgage?" And they wrote a check. And they delivered it to the bank, and, and they, it's done. And they covered everything in that check. That's everything. That's incredible. Escrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Property taxes. 
In fact, somebody made the remark, and this is kind of off script, but but uh, that Jesus didn't just pay 100% of our debt. He covered it more. He covered 120%. Because hmm. you get in the Old Testament, and restitution was supposed to be made one, add one-fifth to the value. Hmm. And Jesus oh. fulfilled the Old Testament law. And so, therefore, he not only covered all our sins, he covered just a little bit more, oh, you know, to make sure, you know, so we would have that confidence, not that he had to, but that we would have that confidence. We're covered. We're, we're thoroughly, he didn't forget one sin when he forgave us all our sins. He Amen. didn't forget one. Yeah, Spencer Kimball in the book has this obsession with restitution. Um, uh-huh. And you know, if Christians, we need to think about this. How does restitution play a role in our repentance, in our uh, genuineness of being sorry for sin. So if, if, I've, if I've stolen something from someone, I ought to make an attempt at repaying the money. But the way the gospel logic works in that is different than Kimball tells us. The gospel logic says, Christ played, paid the penalty completely for your offense against God and for your sins and your, your crimes. Um, therefore, having received forgiveness by faith, by looking to Christ mm-hmm. and saying, help a childlike faith having been forgiven now go and repay what you can um if it's appropriate if it's appropriate relationally sometimes it's not sometimes, sometimes it's not possible yeah sometimes it's just not possible and so when when spencer kimball says well if you've committed murder you can't pay restitution then yeah. you can't be forgiven and a gospel the gospel logic says christ paid the penalty christ did it all he, he paid david's all. penalty he paid uh-huh. my penalty yeah. um I, I want i want to make uh, wrong things right, but this isn't penance, and uh, that, this isn't achieving and forgiveness. And that goes back to the Colossians uh, that you quoted, uh, where it says, He forgave us all our sin, all, A-L-L, mm-hmm. that includes murder, that includes adultery, that A-L-L means all-inclusive, right? Yeah, and what's cool about Colossians is he goes on in the application of the book, he says, uh, I have it right here, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has past, past tense, tense forgiven you so you must also forgive uh-huh. so the gospel logic of community now is I was unworthy I was an irrational sinner uh, it was an enemy of God I was a stubborn um, I was a jerk and God forgave me so when I encountered emotionally difficult stubborn resistant people in my life who are hard to get along with. The gospel logic says, because he forgave you, mm-hmm. then uh, appeal to the cross, appeal to the Holy Spirit in you and say, Lord, you forgave me. So give me all the energy I need to love these difficult people. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, this exactly. is especially important in marriage. Right. When you get close to someone in, in marriage, uh, it's so hard, you, the people you love the most, and yet there's so much friction at times mm-hmm. because you're so close to people. And the people who most love you can most hurt you. The gospel is meant to be the foundation of my marriage and my parenting. So when either spouse in my marriage has sinned against the other, it's not I'm a better person I, if they were only. No, it's, it's the starting point. It's me. Christ forgave me. So I take, I'm the first one to apologize, hopefully. And, and that's what living the gospel is. It's not living out all of these books and rituals and, and the inclusive, like we talked at the beginning of the first show, what, uh, or, or of another, excuse me, is another show I'm thinking of, uh, where, where the gospel is inclusive of all the doctrines of the church. Living out the gospel is forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you. Yeah. And you can't. That's what it is. What, what's really cool about this is I, could, I can tell someone who's not a believer, who, who doesn't know the true gospel, I can tell them, I can obey the commandments better than you can right now. And it, there's, a, there's a catch to this. Okay. <laughs> it's not because I'm a better person than you are. It's because I've been commanded, though, to forgive as I've been forgiven. And you can't do that if you're not forgiven. So uh, being wow. forgiven empowers me well, to that's... love difficult people. Jesus says, he who is forgiven little loves, loves little. little. So I can love people more having been forgiven than having never been forgiven. Mm-hmm. So if you ought to be, and this is more, I call it the back door to the gospel. If you're so concerned with uh, developing a, a licent- a, an attitude towards sin of, of flippant, like, oh, if I was forgiven for free, I'd be so flippant about the seriousness mm-hmm. of holiness and good works and uh, the purpose of life. Well, here's the back door to the gospel. If you want to be the kind of person that loves your enemy, that fights the innermost 
horrible hypocrisy within you that loves difficult people, if you want to satisfy what looks like a kingdom citizen and, and the Sermon on the Mount, the best way to accomplish that is by having all your sins forgiven and achieving liberation from condemnation and guilt. Mm -hmm. If you want to be mm -hmm. freed up emotionally to really scoop out the dirty cup inside of you, and Je Jesus says, uh, better to be clean on the inside than the outside. Well, if you want to uh, let God uh, clean, do the dishwasher stuff right, on that right, horrible, right. Uh, dirty cup. Uh, we have these sippy cups in my house. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you remember this, but sippy cups, uh, kids love their milk, but man, the sippy cup gets lost in the back of a, of a, a couch and you're like, wow, this is all awful. Um, <laughs> I'm, so I, that's a side note. That, he's thinking about <laughs> illustrations here. God wants to clean the inside of our cup. Right. And the best way to accomplish inner spirituality that isn't shown to be totally hypocritical. This is, this is the horrible irony here. If you pursue justification with God, if you say, I'm going to be right with God by trying really hard to be righteous and then someday he'll forgive me. The irony there is you'll show up at final judgment and you'll be exposed as a fraud, mm -hmm. a hypocrite. Right. Somebody who's fundamentally not born again, don't care about all the rituals and the, your religious participation. If you refuse free forgiveness, yeah. you will be exposed as a fraud at final judgment. Mm -hmm. But if you say, Lord, I am a fraud. Lord, I need to be born again. Lord, I'm fundamentally corrupt. Please freely forgive me right now. Right now, just forgive all of me right now. And if you go to the Lord Jesus Christ and you cry out to him and you confess him as your Lord, your Savior, your real forgiver. The irony is that he will forgive you and then he'll begin a relationship with you relationship. and he'll develop a heart yes. change, sanctifying, beautiful, yeah. hard, stumbling growth so that at the end of your life, at final judgment, when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, cancels all the sin record against you mm -hmm. and he, he puts your heart open uh, he fillets it on the table for all to see. You will be publicly vindicated right. as a exactly. saint that was forgiven and changed and transformed. And this is, it's a beautiful thing because everyone wants, at deepest in their heart, everyone wants to be vindicated as someone who is real and not a fraud. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a little bit of fear. Am I a hypocrite? Am I a fraud? The Lord Jesus Christ says, uh, you will not be put to shame. Right. It, it, right. You're going Great to be promises. vindicated as a true Great saint promises. and a believer if you call upon his name and are freely forgiven. Freely but if forgiven. you pursue the route of religion and qualification and temple recommends and kosher polygamy. law and circumcision and or polygamy, polygamy, if you play the religion game, yeah. that will always let you down. It will, it will never you. fundamentally change your heart. That's right. So, thanks that's for absolutely right. No, that's true. Here. That's very true. But good, good way to put that. I, I love it. Okay, I love it. Uh, the next couple of questions I have Sorry. are are going a little bit different. Please. Um, uh, rabbit trail yeah. as we've been through down many, but I still think it needs to be said. He wrote on page two eighty six. Quote: We are gods in embryo, oh, and the Lord yeah. demands perfection of us. Mm. And then in the book Teachings of the Prophet or uh, the teachings of Spencer W. Kimball on page 28, he said, man has in himself the seeds of Godhood. Mm. Uh, you know, it's really what inappropriate that about that. <laughs> well, I mean, for the, for the Latter-day Saint, it's, it's, well, there's, there's untapped energy or ability or competency built within your very being that you can reach into and help you become righteous and qualified and worthy. Um, you're the you're the seeds of deity. You know you're yeah. a God embryo, mm -hmm. so you can be righteous. You can do this. The Christian humility s instead says, "God is God. Mm. I am not. Mm -hmm. I was created." Jesus says, "I am from above. You are from below. Right. I am from before. You are from after." Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus says, "Before Abraham was, I am." Right. There's something fundamentally different about Jesus. He's from above. He's from before. He was. In the beginning was, with the, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh. God became a man. Right. To be among us, to dwell with us. Not God, not, not man became a God. This is, the, this is what makes Christmas awesome. Yes, it does. It's not that the Lord Jesus Christ was advancing 
toward full exaltation and steps of progression. Right. It's that the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the all reality, the one who is before time, became a grasshopper, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. If we were an ant, mm -hmm. it's though, as though he joined our ant colony. Yeah. And he became, the, the omnipotent Lord became a little baby, not a Superman. Right. Not a, not right. a di uh, interesting. And, and, and a, lived as an ant with the ants. A, a, a genuine ant, as it were, right. a genuine human here. Spencer Kimball, I'm sorry, uh, Bruce McConkie in Mormon Doctrine has a section where he uh, likens Jesus' humanity. Uh, he has a section, he has a section called Demigod. Oh my. <laughs> and he, he connects it to, the, to sort of the, 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 the spin that he has on virgin birth. This is to your point, the question. Mm -hmm. uh, in Mormonism, even in polygamist Mormonism, uh, fundamentalist Mormonism, God the Father, an exalted man, I like to call him the Superman of Mormonism. Uh, these aren't really true deities. They're just right, super exalted Superman. Right. Descended to earth and had sexual relations with Mary. And uh, the way the modern LDS uh, authors reason about it is they say, oh, well, Jesus had half mortal DNA. 50% of his DNA was immortal. Oh, and so he has this no. sort of demigod, superman, uh, infinite power to experience infinite psychophysiological pain in the garden. Oh. And therefore they reason his atonement is infinite in value because he's a demigod superman able to withstand such suffering. Now the, the Christian says, no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. Oh. God, 100% God became 100% authentic man. Right. You punched him in the arm, it would have hurt. And he was still 100% God. Two natures. Yeah, you killed the author of life. Right. But you killed the author of life, Peter right. says. Uh, the, so yeah. the, the payment for sin was accomplished not because, not because Christ is a demigod superman, but because he's the Lamb of God who's spotless. It's because of the identity of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. our power, the, the power that we have, this is finalized as an answer. <laughs> The power that we have to combat sin, to fight hypocrisy, to pursue holiness, is not that we're gods and embryo. It's that the same power, the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, that raised Jesus, a true man, from the dead, right. is in, in us. us. Exactly. And we died with Christ, and now we're being, as it were, resurrected very, right now to be a new man, a new woman right. in Christ. And so we have that power living in us. By the way, this is in Ephesians chapter 1, if anybody thinks, wants to test what we're saying, that we do have that power, that resurrection power living in us that enables us to, to uh, not sin, not want to sin, and to live that new life of sanctification, becoming sanctified like, uh, like the Bible tells us. Okay. Um, uh, I want to write, um, I want to talk a little bit more. Uh, we're not going to have time to cover everything, but we're getting close to the end. Um, one person walked away from the book and said, it's a miracle if you feel forgiveness, mm -hmm. um, if you even experience any kind of forgiveness uh, for after reading the book. Another responder said that, uh, that Kimball referenced Doctrine and Covenants section 132 more than any other scripture in mm -hmm. writing that book, which to him made it look like that he was pointing to eternal bliss in the marriage bed. Hmm. Um, whether that's really what he had in mind or not, but I find it interesting that that's the scripture that he referenced the most in that book. I, 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 would, need that? To I would need to confirm that. I don't know about the reference ratio, but I do know that he does spend a lot of time thinking about courtship and marriage and dating and the importance of being married on purpose to somebody who has a temple recommend. And sexual sin, he, he talks a lot about that, which yeah. would be quoted section 132 from that as well. He, he, he does a good job of making people feel deep shame over sexual sin. <laughs> he it, does. It's super interesting. He does. There's got to be something going on with Kimball about that. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to, to imply that he did something that he's not telling us about, but it's just he, he's had so many... Uh, interviews. He's had so many counseling interactions with people mm -hmm. and he, he felt like that was the kind of thing that could... Well, you know, when you don't have the power of God at work in, in inside of you and also in your religion, there's nothing left but human works. 
And so his desire would be to, to rev people up, to, to want to do better works and greater works, to, to reach the goal that they're looking towards. But they can't do it on their own because they're rejecting the power that God gives us through Jesus Christ, through, through being born again. Sexual shame is powerful. And, I and think especially when they make it more shameful. He, when they amplify it. Right. Uh, well, there's a side note here. This is worth noting. The way Spencer Kimball speaks about people who have been sexually assaulted or who have, been, who have participated, um, well, in his mind, uh, haven't sufficiently fought off a rape attempt. Mm -hmm. The way he speaks mm -hmm. about that is totally it's, inappropriate it's and anti-pastoral. Yeah. That, that's yeah. not, not Christ-like at all. But what's cool about the gospel is that it can take the deepest of even legitimate sexual shame, which Kimball is exploiting, that even the deepest of sexual shame the woman caught in adultery. The woman caught in adultery. Caught publicly. The, the Samaritan woman, the same uh, thing. Oh, you've had, was it five or six husbands? Yeah. Uh, Jesus can take that and forgive you with a word. And if I can and just say one more. And cleanse the shame. It, totally cleanse it. What's, it, what's awesome. I would, I, would, I would encourage anyone to look at the Gospel of Matthew and to look at how Jesus can stop a storm with his words. The paralytic. There's a cool, we'll end on, I'll end on that. Jesus <laughs> is, uh, he's in the house and the paralytic is brought through the, the hole in a roof. Mm -hmm. And everyone's watching to see what Jesus is going to do. And what he says is, son, the first thing he says is, son, your sins are forgiven. forgiven. Boom. And so I would say to anyone who feels deep sexual shame, the Lord Jesus Christ, with a mustard seed of faith in your heart, can look at you and hit, you can just forget the words of all other leaders in your life, all right. other religious authorities, and hear the words of Jesus say, you are forgiven. And that's enough. And very, very quickly, we only have a few a few seconds left. The Samaritan woman, she was had been despised by her community. She was mm. out getting water by herself, alone, mm. in the middle of the day. That shows that she was ostracized. Mm. Jesus spoke with her and told her everything about her and didn't shame her at all. And what does she do? She runs into town and talks to all oh, the people wow. who had rejected her. She oh. doesn't carry the shame at all. She, wow. she wasn't embarrassed to go talk to him. So, and, 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 and of course, that is her, her cleansing. God cleansed her from her shame and forgave her, and she do it. We're at the end of our time again, Aaron. Thank you. I'm sorry I, if I was overly monologue. Oh, no, 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 you did beautiful. I thank you so much for sharing and, and for thank your you. excitement about all this. I'm excited. That's why it's called Good News. And we do thank Aaron for sharing with us as we discuss the truth of biblical repentance and forgiveness. The entire Christian message is to keep our eyes and our hope and our focus on Jesus Christ alone. When the doctrines of men are included, our focus is diverted from Jesus only and then to our own words or the commands uh, of man to take his place. Only Jesus, through God's grace, has any power, and it is all power to save the sinner from perishing. Anything or anyone that takes our focus off Jesus needs to be rejected and replaced by Jesus and by Jesus alone. He is our only hope of glory, as we've talked about in this. He's our only hope for full forgiveness and cleansing of shame and guilt. There is nothing and there is no one that can help or guarantee celestial glory. Jesus Christ does it all, all by himself. Thanks for watching.